This morning our text comes from Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning in the 38th verse, Luke 10, 38. Out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's Word, I invite you to stand as you're able. Jesus visits Mary and Martha. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May you be seated. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a, a fascinating text. For those that are familiar with the New Testament and, and really Christian stories as a whole, this is one of the more familiar texts in, in, the, in the Christian um, story, if you will. Many people, even in the secular world, know of the story of Mary and Martha, and their names have been synonymous with the very simplistic understanding of this particular story. Many preachers would, would be pretty simple in this, and, and I have in the past as well, where you look at it and you say, you know, Martha's just too busy, and Mary's paying attention to Jesus, and Jesus says, you need to pay more attention and quit worrying about all that mess. And then you're done and we all go home and eat lunch and watch the rest of the Open Championship for those of us that are golf fans. But there's more to this text than that. There's a lot more to this text than that. It's a short text, it's a short story, but it is rich and deep with meaning and understanding. I want to run through that a little bit this morning. We need to pay attention to where this text falls in Luke's Gospel. This story comes right after the story of the Good Samaritan. It's another story with which most people are very familiar. And again, a term that has worked its way into secular vernacular. A Good Samaritan is someone who takes care of a stranger in a way that is unusual or beyond what would be expected. And so we see in the story of the Good Samaritan someone who unexpectedly comes and, and comes to the aid of someone that they really shouldn't care about, shouldn't stop to worry about. Yet three religious leaders had passed by and chose to leave this man in the ditch to die, yet the Samaritan came by and picked him up, took him to a nearby place to get care, paid up front for what he would expect the cost to be, and then promised the person that would be his caregiver that I will return and pay you what else other costs are associated with this person's care. And then we get the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus comes into their home and as I alluded to with the children, let's think about that for a moment. How many of us would want to get our houses ready for Jesus to come over? I mean, what does that look like anyway? I mean, I'm sure we all dust off the family Bible and make sure it's open to the Gospels, right? We dust it off and put it in the middle of the coffee table and make sure it's open and maybe even crinkle a few of the pages to make sure it looks like we've been reading through it a little bit. And then there's the big question, and you know, it depends on where you grew up and what, what uh, denomination you grew up in. Is it grape juice or wine? I mean, and if you bring grape juice, if you put a pitcher of water out, you never know what it's going to be by the time you get to dinner. I started, I did something this time in this text that I've never done before, and it, it, because the first thing that popped into my mind was the term Southern hospitality. I was born and raised in Atlanta. I'm a very proud Southerner when it comes to hospitality. And we're in the, we're in the shadows of the world headquarters of the Coca-Cola company. And I don't know about most of you, but for me growing up, one of the things synonymous with hospitality was offering someone an ice cold Coca-Cola in the summer. And we all know that, that it's all Coke, right? 
And somebody comes over and you ask them what they like a Coke, and you ask them what kind of Coke. You know, Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, Mr. Piv, Mellow Yellow. Staying true to the Coke brand of, of beverages you, you might see. I, I've shared with you my neighbor in Pine Mountain, Mr. Alf Mullins. I never came home to the parsonage in the afternoon in the summer that Mr. Alf wasn't sitting on the screened in porch. And I'd hear his, his voice, Preacher, want a Coca-Cola? And he had the, the old Tommy bottle opener mounted to the door frame on the screened in porch. And he brought you a proper Coca-Cola in a glass contour bottle. And you snapped off the top and you sat down in a rocker. And you enjoyed some conversation with your neighbor on a hot summer afternoon. And then when there was Miss Bobby Matthews in Calhoun. Miss Bobby was a quintessential southern lady, right down to the syrupy, sweet southern accent. I've talked about this before. I, depending on where I am, it depends on how detectable my southern accent is. There are people in Georgia that if I go into a small town in Georgia want to know where I'm from, when I know, go to New York City and ask for something, they know exactly where I'm from. I, apparently, as, as, as my southern accent has deteriorated over the years, it still was pretty detectable in the Northeast and the Midwest. But Bobby was amazing because she would have us over to lunch at her house and, and she was this incredible balance of doing for and being with. And that, that's, the, that's the contrast that's being drawn in our text today. Doing for and being with. Bobby could do both. At the same time that she was finishing up an entire proper southern lunch, she could get everybody seated in the right place, get drinks in their hand, napkins under their glass, food on the table, and she never looked busy. She never looked hurried. She never, I never saw a drip of sweat, perspiration. Southern ladies don't sweat, they perspire. Never a drop of perspiration from a brow. And she would sit and we would eat and our, our plates were refilled, but yet it, we never saw her get up, it seemed. Incredible southern hospitality, the balance of doing for and being with. If we go back to the story of the Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan, he had the proper balance of doing for and being with. He was present with the person at their very time of need, but he knew that person had needs beyond his ability and he needed to continue on his way. So he found someone else and he did for that person beyond which, that which he was able but then we come to Mary and Martha, and as I've said, it's easy to take one side or the other. I'm an only child, and so this sister dynamic I'm not as familiar with, but Shannon's an identical twin. We have, I know, at least more twins in here, and, and, um, and, and so, and, and Shannon has a brother, and it, you hear them sit around and talk about who were the ones that actually did the work and who just sat around being the beneficiary of all the work. And, and brothers and sisters, siblings understand that dynamic. I, I really don't. I, I, I didn't grow up in that environment. But it, it's fascinating to look at this story. And so what I did is I thought about the, the term Southern hospitality, and I began to think about that word hospitality. And all of a sudden it dawned on me there, there are all these other words in our English language that have a similar root. And, and I went and looked at it, and as best I can do in my research, and I, I'm interested in even digging deeper into this, but my research this week, the beginning of the research on this led me to this, is that the, the root for many of these words is the Latin hospice, H-O-S-P-E-S. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. That same root is the root for hospitality, hospitable, hospital. Hostile, host, 
and hospice. And, and I tried to look at all those words and their individual meanings, and maybe the most fascinating thing is that the word hospice, this root, H-O-S-P-E-S, in the Latin, actually was used to describe both the host and the guest. That that same root word, hospice, was used to describe both the host and the guests. And what it does is it helps us understand that very narrow distinction between host and guest. Because, again, as we know in the South, we want to be both gracious hosts and gracious guests. My mom's one of the pickiest eaters in the world, and her mother once told her, if you don't learn how to eat better and and be able to eat something off your plate, you're going to feel guilty later in life when you're invited to someone's home and you have to eat something off that plate. Now, my grandmother should have known my mom better than that. She doesn't embarrass that easily, and she'll, she'll pick around it with the best of them. That being said, mom raised me, at least somewhere, indirectly, and is that if I go into someone's home and they've taken the time to prepare something to eat, I'm going to do my best to find something on that plate that I can eat. Now, granted, I, I like it a whole lot better when you get to serve yourself because having to push some stuff around the plate to make it look like you've eaten some is a difficult task. And, and as a preacher, you really can't get away with that because people are watching exactly what you eat and how much you eat. Preacher, don't you like that? Please don't ever ask me a question where you're going to make me lie. Don't do that. Just don't put me in that position. Because I, I, I'm a little better eater, but not much better and pretty picky and don't really like healthy food all that well. But being a gracious host and a gracious guest is, is the same skill set required for both. What's also interesting about this story with Mary and Martha and Jesus is it's difficult to tell whether or not Jesus is the host or the guest. Because as is often the case, when Jesus is the room, he takes priority. And he kind of takes control of the situation. Just like I just said, you don't want to ever ask a question that you're not going to know the answer to. Martha made a critical error. Lord, don't you care that Mary's just sitting around doing nothing? Martha was certain what the answer was going to be. You're right, Martha. Mary, get up and help your sister. And that is not the answer that she received. Now, before we beat up on Martha... People read a lot into this text, and they read into it that Jesus said that she didn't need to do what she was doing, and that's not the case. Jesus was a guest in their home, and food did need to be prepared, and and they did need to get the house ready. And and clearly, if we look back to to the story of the Good Samaritan, do do you remember what set up the, the parable of the Good Samaritan? A lawyer was trying to trick Jesus, and I always love these scenes when a lawyer is trying to trick Jesus. It's always a a fun scene. Because the lawyer asks, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written in the law? What do you read there? He he knows the, the, the lawyer knows the answer to that question. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said, yep, you're right. But knowing that that the lawyer was digging for more, he tells this story about the Good Samaritan helping the person And at the end, what Jesus says is, go and do likewise. So we seem to have two contrasting stories. Again, in one story, the Good Samaritan, right before Mary and Martha, Jesus says, go and do likewise. And in the story of Mary and Martha, Jesus seems to be saying, chill out. Spend some time with one another. Again, it's a balance I've said this before, and once again in the past few weeks, we have seen this borne out in culture and in media. There are people, there are groups in this society that want to make us an either-or society. There are people, there are groups in this world that want to put us on opposite ends of a spectrum. They want to divide us. They want us to be far away from one another. 
Because as we know, the, the, the old saying, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus knew that. He, he shared that. We, we live in a world that wants to be either or. And in my experience, most things are both and. Most, thing, most things in this world are somewhere in the middle. And, and these two stories told next to one another and Jesus' admonition to go and do likewise and Jesus' admonition to choose the right thing, to be still, to be present, is a both and admonition. Because we read these stories in their continuity and we understand that there's sometimes where we need to simply be present and there are times when we need to go and do likewise not either or but both and and sometimes we have to do it at the same time so this Latin root hospice and hospitality and a hospitable hospital I think one of the most difficult things for long, young clergy to learn is the ability to simply be present. When I say young clergy, not necessarily even with age. We have so many men and women that come into the ministry later in life. And so I'm going to say inexperienced clergy, people that are new to ministry or to caregiving. The tendency is to be like Martha. The tendency is we want to do for others. We want to have just the right words. We've spent three plus years in seminary learning how to read the words the right way and preach the words the right way and teach the words the right way. And we've got all this knowledge and we want to share it with the world. We want to let everybody know how smart we are. What I've learned is that most of the time in situations in which someone is ill, are hurting. The most powerful thing I can do is sit in the room, stand in the room, and be quiet and listen. And to help that person or that family feel God's presence. A silent presence in the room is often the most powerful thing that we can offer someone in need. Now that being said, there's a balance. And there's some people that just want to sit around and do nothing. They just want to pray and everything's going to be all right. And, and y'all have heard it way too many times, but it's such a good story. The two guys that are sitting on their porch when the floods came and in years past, when we've been in the middle of the drought, this story may not have meant a lot, but in the past few weeks, as the water is saturated and the rains have come and the water rushes down the middle of the street like a river, you can almost imagine sitting on the front porch with these two gentlemen as the, as the bus comes by and says, we're here to take you to shelter. And they say, well, we're praying to God and God's going to save us. And several hours later, the floodwaters have risen to the first floor and they're standing in the second floor room and the boat comes by and says we're going to take you to shelter and they say we're praying to God and God's going to save us and the flood rises flood waters rise further and they're standing on the rooftop and the helicopter says this is your last chance and they die and they go to heaven and they ask God or they tell God we prayed for you to save us and he said I sent you a bus a boat and a helicopter what else do you want Sometimes we need to go and do. Sometimes we need to be an active participant, either in our own predicament or the predicament of another. Sometimes we just need to be a good host or a good guest. Jesus is actually a bit of a rude guest, if you think about it. I mean, probably the proper southern reaction would be when our, when our host tries to draw us into an argument with her sister is that for us to say, well, I'm just not going to get in the middle of that. I'm grateful to both of you and for all that you're doing to provide this wonderful place for me. But Jesus is never one to back down from something like this. I, I, 
People, people talk about how peaceful Jesus is, and I believe that Jesus came to bring peace. But if you read the Gospels, Jesus never backs down from a confrontation. He doesn't. And if he's asked to enter into the fray, I, my reading of the Gospel is that he's all too willing to enter into the fray. And so he basically tells Martha, well, since you asked... We don't know what he may have said to Mary. Mary never utters a word. She just sits at the feet of the rabbi and listens and learns. I found the word hostile to be interesting. I, I have had the privilege of traveling to, traveling to Europe on several occasions. On at least a couple of those occasions, I, I did the college thing and I stayed at youth hostels along the way. And we had a I had a directory. One summer I stayed in London and stayed at a youth hostel and would go out to Wimbledon and watch matches at day, during the day on the cheap. And then one time a buddy of mine and I, he was studying in Paris for an entire year and I traveled to Paris over spring break and for the last few days we rented a car and we traveled throughout France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. We basically just drove the whole time. If you know anything about the geography of that, those countries are fairly close proximity, but, but you can drive them and enjoy the beauty of all of that. We didn't anticipate snow in March, and we began to drive down the Autobahn, the Romantic Highway, toward Neuweinstein, which is where the castle that the Cinderella Castle is modeled after is. And we got there, and it was beautiful, and it began to snow. And we were trying to get over into Austria to spend the night, and it began to snow really hard. And while all of our German friends were blowing past us on the Autobahn in their Mercedes, we were in our little French rental car that was just big enough for the two of us and a couple bags. And we followed a, a snow scraper over the mountain into Innsbruck. And we were looking for Frau Tutti Wolf's house. It was a little bed and breakfast. And, and we had the address, and we, we called up, and... Um, we had to stop at a payphone back then. And we called up and, and she said, sure, I've got plenty of room. And we arrived, if, if you, it, try not to be stereotypical, but if you can imagine in your mind an Austrian bed and breakfast and a German or Austrian Hausfrau, if you just imagine that in your mind for a minute, that is exactly what welcomed us at her little B&B. She opened the door and she had on the apron, the, I mean, the, I promise you, the whole nine yards. She showed us to our room. She made sure that everything was exactly as it needed to be, that we were as comfortable as possible. The next morning, she, we woke up to a fresh breakfast that had been prepared for us. And we, we got up and we were able to share in that meal and enjoy her hospitality. It was incredible. It was amazing. We woke up and we walked out the door and a blanket of snow covered the entire mountainside down into the valley. And get this, she had a, a dog. It was a German shepherd that she had saved. It had become snow blind. It had been lost in the snow and become snow blind and she had nurtured it back to health. And that was the sweetest, most loving dog you've ever seen. After she made sure we had one more piece of bread and one more cup of coffee, we got on the road and headed back toward our destination. Found some incredible hospitality of my hosts and hostels and bed and breakfasts. What I wasn't maybe thinking about at the beginning of the sermon was the root being hospital and hospice. We all know of the medical knowledge and expertise necessary for healing. We're all very familiar with doctors and nurses that provide such incredible care, but both in the hospital and particularly in hospice care, for those of us that have been privileged to have family or friends as a pastor having, having experienced this, what I would call ministry, many, many times, we all know that particularly in a hospice situation, equally as important, if not more important, is medical expertise is this gift of presence, the gift of being the host, 
the gift of providing space for the person that's ill and the loved ones that are there to be with them. I, I marvel every time I encounter a physician or a nurse in a hospice facility and the, the grace with which they conduct their craft, their ministry, their service. All of these things are about the balance of doing for and being with. And we live in a world that each day we need to find and strike that balance. Because there are some people that need us to do for them. And there are some people that need us to be with them. And there are times that we... That one of the failures of Southern hospitality, at least in, in my family, was that often those that were best at extending hospitality were the very worst at receiving it. Sometimes we need to allow someone else to do for us and to be present with us. And we need to be willing to sit and receive that grace and that love. Mary and Martha both were doing what was asked of them, what was required of them, what they thought they should be doing. The Good Samaritan gives us an example that as we go forth, we need to learn how to both do for and be with. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.